morning, aviators. This is your captain speaking. And we're off. Hello, everybody. It's Finding Glory. Hey, oh, whoa, where's my face? A little bit of a different kind of video today. Usually, this is a relationship vlog, but just for this one video, it's going to be a movie channel, and I'm just going to be talking today. I feel like it's hard for me to get my thoughts out sometimes when I don't know what to do with my hands on camera or, you know, where to look, because I'm just a generally very awkward person. I'm not sure what to do with my hands. Uh, be good just to hold them down by okay. your side. Yeah, great. So we're trying it this way. Let me know what you guys think. And it's just me today, too. Glory's not here with me for this. And the reason for that is because I watch a lot of movies. And she watches, like, a regular amount of movies. And by a lot of movies, I mean of all the movies that were released in 2022, I saw probably a hundred of them. Obviously, this is a passion of mine. I have a lot of thoughts on these movies, and if this channel is us sharing our lives with you, this is something I wanted to share with you. So just for this one video, I'm going to get all my thoughts out. I've narrowed all the year's movies down to my top 10 favorite movies, plus some honorable mentions. And uh, hopefully I can introduce you to a movie or two that you've never heard of that interest you, or maybe I can encourage you to watch that one movie that you've heard of, but you were wondering if it was really worth watching. And this is probably going to be a pretty long video, by the way, so I'll put timestamps in the description below for anyone who wants to skip through it and see all of my movies up front. I will spend a little bit of time talking about every movie in my top 10, though. So without further ado, let's get started. Quick stretch, little snack, and here we go. Okay, so I'm going to start off with some honorable mentions. And to be clear, I haven't seen every movie I wanted to see this year, but I made my ranking based off what I have seen. So in alphabetical order, my first honorable mention is Avatar, The Way of Water. What a beautiful movie this is. And for those of you who are complaining that the story isn't very good in this movie or in the last movie, get off your high horses. It's not about the story. It's about the experience in IMAX 3D. And James Cameron is the only person that knows how to stage a movie for IMAX 3D like this. Barbarian was a really interesting horror movie that I did not know was coming, but when I watched it, I was pleasantly surprised. If you don't know anything about this movie, great. That's exactly how it should be going into it. It will constantly reinvent itself, and you will not have any idea what's going to happen around the corner or in the next scene. The Batman was almost as good as The Dark Knight. Robert Pattinson, despite what many people expected, was a great Batman. The Batmobile chase blew me away. Loved it. I don't know what's happening over at DC, but I really hope Matt Reeves gets to tell the next chapter of this story, because I like everything he does. I got you! I got you! Take that, you friggin' psycho! I got you! <laughs> Black Phone was another horror movie that I really liked. Thank God Scott Derrickson decided to jump ship from Doctor Strange 2 and make this movie. It was a delightful horror movie. That's a weird way to describe a horror movie, but Ethan Hawke was pretty freaky in it as a child kidnapper, and this movie really stuck with me after I watched it. Decision to Leave was a Korean drama, kind of a Korean take on that 60s noir inspector story. He gets stuck on a case. He can't sleep. He's got insomnia. Suddenly, he finds himself at the center of the case. He's confused. You, you almost start to question what's a lie and what is reality. I'm sure we're going to see it in the conversation for Best International Feature when the Oscars come around. Speaking of Oscars, Austin Butler better get a nomination for Elvis. He was a revelation in that movie. Say what you will about Baz Luhrmann's style and his editing choice, and I still don't know where I fall in that conversation. But I do know that Austin Butler was incredible, and this movie breathed a lot of life into the legend that is Elvis. Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. Where did this movie come from? What? I think I remember Marcel being a thing on YouTube like 10 years ago. Had no idea this was happening, but it was a pleasant surprise. If you liked Marcel 10 years ago, then this is a very cute, heartwarming little feature for him. Her? Him? I don't know. The Menu. I saw the trailer for this. I didn't understand what it was about. I just knew that it had something to do with food, and then I watched it. I think the pacing was great throughout. I had a great time the whole way through, and I think it lived out its concept to its full potential. 
Another movie I saw that I don't think anyone's heard of is The Outfit. I don't know why nobody's talking about this movie. I think it came out in March. I saw it and I said, I think this should get a screenplay nomination and maybe even an actor nomination for Mark Rylance. He plays a cutter or a tailor basically and the movie kind of stages its screenplay as if it is a suit being tailored to you, the audience, which was a metaphor that I thought was really unique. There's a lot of tension in this movie. It involves the mafia and the whole movie takes place in one location. It's basically a stage play and I thought the whole thing was written really well to keep me engaged. Prey is the best Predator sequel we've gotten since the original Predator. Why did it come out on Hulu? I don't understand. Some people took issue with this movie. How can she possibly beat a Predator? But what they don't realize is this movie takes it back to the basics. It's not about technology. It's not about brawn. It's about hunter versus hunted. Who's who? I don't know. But you gotta be smart to win. This movie was a huge redemption after 2019's The Predator. A movie that I really didn't expect to make it even into the honorable mentions was Spirited on Apple TV Plus with Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds. This movie looked like it was just going to be the next Will Ferrell with insert guest star having fun on camera for a while, but I was pleasantly surprised. Felt like the Christmas spirit was very alive in this movie, and that's mostly thanks to both of them really bringing a lot of charisma to the roles and the characters. I actually was invested in them and the relationship that they were building. I like this movie and it's on here because I feel like a lot of people write off Will Ferrell pretty quickly these days. Top Gun Maverick was the other blockbuster aside from Avatar. It probably should have been in my top 10 but for some reason I just didn't get the same experience that everyone else was getting in the theater and that's weird because I love Tom Cruise. The guy is crazy his commitment to his craft. And it shows in this movie, it looks incredible. The emotion is there, the characters are there, the nostalgia is there. I just, I don't know, I didn't get that extra something that it needs to be to be in my top 10. And last but not least is Violent Night. I had a blast. Whoever decided to cast David Harbour as Santa Claus deserves a raise. This is basically die hard if John McClane was the real Santa Claus. It's very John Wicky, the action is great and brutal and violent as the title might suggest. And a little pro tip, if you find yourself a drinking buddy, go watch this movie, take a sip of alcohol every time Santa or Christmas is said, and you're guaranteed to have a good time. That is a terrible thing to want for Christmas. Maybe you and I should discuss that in person. Santa Claus is coming to town. All right, so that's all of my honorable mentions, and I'm gonna go ahead and talk about number 10. The unbearable weight of massive talent. How is Nicolas Cage the worst actor, but also the best actor you've ever seen? And how is he in all the worst movies and all the best movies? And how is this movie all of those things combined? And before your asshole has had a chance to pucker up, your medulla oblongata will be splattered on the f-ing wall behind you. And if that's the last thing I accomplish on this beautiful green earth, well then, ha! Huh? I say, ha! What a way to f- go. What an enigma Nicolas Cage is. There has never been another actor like Nicolas Cage. And there never will be another actor like Nicolas Cage. So the fact that Nicolas Cage was willing to play Nicolas Cage in a movie about Nicolas Cage, this movie was one of a kind. And I had to have it in my top 10 list, partly because Movies that are just mainly comedies, I feel like are a dying breed. And this to me, with such unusual subject matter as Nicolas Cage, I feel like we might be looking at a timeless comedy here, an instant cult classic. It's really funny. I love the relationship between him and Pedro Pascal's character. Their budding bromance is adorable. And all the deep cuts into Nicolas Cage. The big ones like National Treasure, but then guarding Tess, or you saw the chainsaw from Mandy at one point. That's one of my favorite Nicolas Cage movies. This movie goes down the rabbit hole. And I feel like after watching it, we're just one step closer to understanding the infinite puzzle that is Nicolas Cage. Nick Number nine, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. I guess there were like three Pinocchio movies this year. I was really only aware of two of them. And the other one I heard was really bad. I didn't watch it, but that's kind of ironic considering that that was the one made by Disney themselves. But I guess it's also not that much of a surprise given their track record with the live action remakes. 
but Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, talk about a reimagination. This movie takes place during World War II in fascist Italy, and there are Nazis, and there are rich themes of life, death, loss, war, corruption, and exploitation, and there's heart. The first ten minutes, it's like up. It tears your heart out. All of this in a Pinocchio movie. And Guillermo del Toro, I just love him more and more every year. His passion for his craft shows, especially here with the stop motion animation, which appeals to every one of his strengths, like creature design, production design, cinematography. I don't know if stop motion can get a nomination for cinematography, but if that's a thing, I think Pinocchio should get a nomination. The care and precision behind the animation here, and a big shout out to the animators themselves too that work with Guillermo del Toro. You can watch some of the behind the scenes footage of this movie. It's crazy what they do. They have to build all these little tiny dolls with, I think they said it was like a Swiss watch of mechanisms inside their face to make them have all these different facial expressions. And there's replicas of each doll with big ones and small ones and all the sizes in between. And they have to build the sets too. And they have to have access to the dolls inside the sets. So the sets have to accommodate for them and their hands. And then of course there's the actual, you know, taking a picture and then moving it just the slightest bit and taking another picture. I'm kind of speechless at the way they were able to put this movie together. And I guess Guillermo del Toro has been working on this for 15 years, but it shows. I think he might have some of that blue fairy magic because he breathed more life into the story of Pinocchio than I think it's had in decades, maybe even ever. I don't know, but it should not only be nominated for Best Animated Feature this year, it should absolutely win and maybe even get a nomination for Best Picture. Who are you? I feel as though you've been here before. I am Pinocchio. I'm a boy. And I think I'm... dead. Ah, yes. The wooden boy with the borrowed soul. Number eight, The Northman. I don't care how much you lift, bro. You are not ready for the amount of testosterone Robert Eggers injects into the story of Amleth, which is really just the story of Hamlet set in Viking times. But when your movie culminates in two naked buff dudes screaming and sword fighting to the death on top of an erupting volcano, you have earned a spot in my top 10 list. <laughs> there is an insane amount of adrenaline. You will be out of breath just watching it. There are reports that some of the actors were crying on set because they were giving everything for the camera and they just had nothing left. Unfortunately, this movie seems to be getting ignored for the award ceremony, but I feel like it's earned many nominations like best score or sound mixing, best cinematography or best visual effects. I don't know, maybe even best director. Nicole Kidman is in this movie, and shamefully, she will be remembered this year more for her stupid AMC commercial than she will for this amazing bone-chilling performance. Your taste and your mind reek of your foul father. You should have joined him in death. Your words are poison! I am your death. <laughs> This is Robert Eggers' third feature film that he's wrote and directed. I liked The Witch. I liked The Lighthouse more. But this movie might just be his magnum opus. There are multiple long takes in this movie that include meticulous blocking and stunts and blood and gore. And I can't imagine how many tries they had to do to get it as good as it was. And the intensity that he achieves is just unrelenting in this way. This is an experience... It's unfortunate that it doesn't seem to be in the conversation for award season, and it didn't seem to do very well in the box office either. But hopefully someday this movie will get the recognition it deserves. I am Amleth the Bad Wolf, son of King Arvand and War Raven, and I am his vengeance! Number 7. Strawberry Mansion. What is Strawberry Mansion, you might ask? That's a good question. You probably haven't heard of this movie, and that's okay. I barely caught wind of this movie. I had a friend who wouldn't stop talking about it, so I finally checked it out, but it was well after it came out, and it turned out to be the most creatively free movie I saw the entire year. If we're talking about film here, it's a visually creative output, literally 
anything your imagination can think up, you can put it in a movie. So why do we settle for movies about a guy sitting at a bus stop talking to strangers? I've worn lots of shoes. Okay, maybe that's a little bit unfair to Forrest Gump, but you get my point. The sky is the limit, and that's truly the case in this movie. This movie explores outside of the box thinking. It might not be the biggest budget of the year. It's a very small movie. Obviously, it didn't have the budget for a wide release or really any marketing, but I'll tell you it has a super interesting premise and the execution of that premise was very charming. The story takes place in the future when the government records and taxes your dreams. And our main character is an auditor of those dreams. He's a number crunchings guy with the duty of going to an old eccentric woman's house and physically watching her recorded dreams and auditing her that way. And he finds himself a fish out of water. He's wearing this dull gray suit, but the entire environment around him is vibrant and colorful and we begin to explore dreamscapes. It could be anything from a pirate adventure to a love interest fantasy to a nightmare. You'll find yourself asking, whose dream is this again? Is this a dream? I also found that the music of the movie entranced me into the dreams along with the characters. Hi, Pebble. Who's that? I realize you probably haven't heard of this movie. Maybe it looks a little bit weird and that might be the case, but I encourage you to check it out. I knew it was gonna be on my top 10 because I'm a real sucker for any movies that explore surrealism like this. Number six is Pearl. I knew that this was gonna be a great year for horror, but the year still held a lot of surprises in that genre. Barbarian was one of them, but the real surprise I think was the sudden emergence of T-West's X franchise. We had X release earlier in the year in March, and just as it was coming out, A24 announced that they had already shot a prequel to this movie and that that movie was going to be released later in the year. Suddenly, this is a franchise. Sure enough, September came around, Pearl was released, and I enjoyed X, but these are two very different movies, and it was Pearl to me that was the real standout of the year. While they both star Mia Goth, this is the one that I think showcased her abilities as an actor, and prove that she really has that uh, <clears throat> X factor, pun intended. But for real, I didn't really know who Mia Goth was before either of these movies. And when I saw her in X, I was like, yeah, she's good. But after I saw her in this, oh my God, why is nobody talking about her performance? For shame to all of you, she is being maligned. This reminded me of Psycho. I felt like I was watching a modern day Norman Bates just lose her mind and she plays it so well where at the beginning of the movie she seems fine but something is just a little bit off and it's just it makes you uncomfortable As the movie progresses, that something gets bigger and more pronounced. And by the end of the movie, you get this, I think it was 10 to 13 minute single take of her sitting at a table across from somebody and she's just talking. It's pure insanity, what she's saying. And you feel as an audience member, just as uncomfortable as that other person sitting across from her feels because you're sitting in the room with a psycho who's becoming unhinged before your very eyes. Terrifying. I will stand by the fact that she should not only be nominated for best performance of the year, she should win. And I might eat those words when I start talking about my number one movie, but it is solely because of that performance that this movie is anywhere on the top 10 list. It's so creepy. And I'm very excited for the third installment this year titled Maxine. Entering into the top five, number five is Fire of Love. And for those of you who don't know, this is actually a documentary. Documentaries aren't really my thing, but I found myself quite taken with this one about a couple of volcanoologists who fall in love due to their mutual love of volcanoes and they do volcano things together. And I realize that it's the second movie on this list that involves doing things next to volcanoes. So maybe I just like volcanoes a lot. I don't know, I've never seen one, but they have. They eat, sleep, and breathe next to volcanoes. Doesn't sound that healthy, and that's because it's not. In fact, they love volcanoes so much that it eventually killed them. 
And that's not a spoiler. It's in the synopsis of this movie. This is about their love, their connection, their relationship. And that, to be honest, was more interesting than the volcanoes themselves. That's why I felt so glued to the screen. Their relationship, much like Nicolas Cage, is such unusual subject matter. Katya and Maurice Kraft had a relationship probably unlike any other relationship that's ever existed, and we are so lucky that when they were lost to the great fiery smoke of the earth, they left behind towers and towers of footage of them researching volcanoes, traveling to volcanoes, just kind of mucking around together. They're so cute and adorable, and that's this movie. You watch them adorably do crazy things next to volcanoes. <laughs> Nothing to see here, just a man and a woman doing what they love together. If you're like me and you missed this movie in theaters, I am assuming it's going to be nominated for Best Documentary this year, and I'm hoping that it will return to theaters for a limited run. If that happens, I will surely be catching it on the big screen, because some of the visuals in this movie, as you saw, are just wild. I got goosebumps through this whole thing. Number four is a movie that I actually saw very recently, and that is Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery. This is the sequel to the 2019 movie Knives Out, and boy did we get Ryan Johnson wrong when The Last Jedi came out. It's time to let old things die. I don't want to spark that debate again, I'll just say that Knives Out is still one of my favorite movies of the last few years. I've rewatched it many times, and when I heard that Ryan Johnson was going to make a sequel to it, I was a little bit worried that he wasn't going to be able to follow it up with the same level of quality. I'm happy to say that my fears were misplaced. Ryan Johnson gathers a bunch of characters on a private island and he's so good at making these characters distinct from each other and larger than life. Ryan Johnson has proven himself to excel with ensemble casts. All the relationships between these characters are so interesting and complex and I think the concept of the glass onion is brilliant. Something that seems layered and complex, but if people would just stop obsessing over the complication of it all, you can look straight through it. It's made of glass. You can see the center. It's in plain sight. It's so dumb. Oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! You can apply that to the characters' relationships. You can apply that to Ed Norton's character. You can apply that to the plot of the movie itself, which actually goes back halfway through the movie and adds a layer to itself, which I've seen this movie a couple times now, and upon repeated viewings, I realized that this was actually the best narrative decision that Ryan Johnson could have made. This twist recontextualizes the entire plot with a new understanding, and we see how the relationship changes between all these different characters, how the motivations change, we see how they're fragile. And you can also see that a lot of these details were set up in plain sight in the first half of the movie, much like a glass onion. The resolution of it all, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I found it all to be very satisfying, very fun, and I can tell that everyone's having a great time. Daniel Craig is having an absolute blast playing Benoit Blanc. Unfortunately, this crime clashed with the presence of Benoit Blanc. Oh, <laughs> that's it. <dead. laughs> See that? That's just enough bit. Very good. Very good. I think this movie deserves a nomination for screenplay, but also production design, as the settings are not just beautifully designed, but also very cleverly put together. Ryan Johnson, as far as I'm concerned, has proven himself to be a very skilled storyteller, especially when it comes to the mystery genre. And I'm really excited, if you didn't know about this, he has a show coming to Peacock this month called Poker Face. Every episode, a new mystery. So that's really exciting. I love Glass Onion. I've seen it a few times now and I can't stop thinking of it. That to me is a sign that it's one of my favorite movies of the year. Number three, we're getting into the top three now. My number three movie is Tar. You might have heard of Tar, you might not have. I went into Tar blind, I didn't know much about it. To be honest, I kind of thought it looked like it might be pretty boring, but it's been a few months now and I can't stop thinking about this movie. Just like I said with Glass Onion, that's a sign that I really resonated with it. Kate Blanchett plays a world-renowned musician and conductor named Lydia Tar. If you didn't know any better, you might think that Lydia Tar was a real person and that this movie was a biopic because it feels like a real person. Lydia Tarr is on top of the world and she's conducting this orchestra and she's gearing up for her life achievement, recording Mahler's Fifth Symphony. And then slowly you'll watch as her whole life starts to crumble 
for various reasons. And I'll tell you what I love most about this movie is the nuance. And what I mean by that is a couple things. Number one, it doesn't spoon feed you any information. It leaves it up to you. It trusts and relies on the intelligence of the audience. And second, it doesn't tell you what to think about anything. This movie is a deep dive into a realistic and complex character with questionable motivations and ethics. And I say questionable not because they're bad, but because they're questionable. And that's what this movie does. It raises questions and starts a conversation. It touches on heavy topics like cancel culture, power dynamics, and the difference in generational thinking, but it's not interested in easy conclusions to any of these conversations. One person could walk away with one conclusion, and another person could walk away with something completely different. And in a time when everybody sees everything as either black or white, nuance is so refreshing. Time is the thing. Uh -huh. Time is, is the essential piece of uh, interpretation. You cannot start without me. See, I start the clock. However, unlike a clock, sometimes my second hand stops, which means that time stops. I think Kate Blanchett unquestionably deserves an Oscar for this movie, and I'm, I'm already <laughs> negating what I said about Mia Goth earlier, I realized, and I knew I would, but she deserves an Oscar, and I think Todd Field should probably get a director nomination, and I think this should definitely get a screenplay nomination. I can't stop thinking and rolling over in my head all the little details in this movie, and that to me speaks to the finesse that director Todd Field and Kate Blanchett bring to the story. I've still only seen it once, and I can't wait to watch it again. And the runner-up to my favorite movie of the year, number two, is Spielberg's new semi-autobiographical movie about his own childhood growing up, The Fablemans. I kind of went into Fablemans thinking that it would just be another love letter to Hollywood like La La Land or Babylon, which wasn't very good, but it turned out to have much bigger, broader themes about life and growing up and how we all discover a passion for something. But with that passion comes side effects that we didn't expect, like people not quite understanding you or the bittersweet conflict between doing what you love and the people you love. And we'd all love to be selfish and just take all the people with us to wherever we need to go. But realistically, you're inevitably going to have to make sacrifices and you're probably going to have to say goodbye to some people. And that's hard. That's a really hard truth to learn. Spielberg, for me, captured that feeling and weaved it perfectly through the tapestry that was this movie. I laughed and cried through every scene. It has that great Spielberg cinematography to it, that great John Williams score. Gabriel LaBelle, I thought, was really good in the movie, and I didn't know who he was before this. And oh my god, I felt paralyzed for every one of the five minutes that Judd Hirsch was in this movie. You think I wanted to leave my sisters, my mama, and my papa and go stick my stupid head in the mouth of lions? Put, putting your head in, in a lion's mouth is art? No, sticking your head at the mouth of lions was balls. Making sure the lion don't eat my head, that is art. I know it was just one scene, but his brief appearance in this movie was as memorable as it was electric, and I think he deserves a nomination for that. In the end, the Oscars have a solid choice, albeit a typical one, for Best Picture this year. But it's not quite what I think is the best choice for Best Picture. And that brings me to my number one. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I, I, I don't even know where to start with this movie. I am in awe. I'm in utter disbelief that this movie exists, let alone works at all. Let me just start with, if you know me, you know I like variety. I said with Strawberry Mansion, I like when a movie thinks outside of the box. I think we should get every kind of movie, always. I like fast movies, I like slow movies, I like action movies, and I like talky movies. I like profound movies, and I like dumb fun movies. This movie is truly all of those, all at once. Never has there ever been a movie that is so stupidly profound and profoundly stupid. My jaw is on the floor. How did they do this? How did the Daniels pull this off? There are so many disparate ideas happening, yet they all work together. This movie has a sound structure of three acts, 
there isn't a single moment or line or object or thing that doesn't eventually feed back in and benefit the greater narrative as a whole. This movie works. All of these things together, they work. I think it was around the time, it was somewhere in the third act when Michelle Yeoh's character was fighting Stephanie Hsu's character and every punch, every move of choreography shifted them into an alternate reality with different scenery and different makeup and different textures even. I think one of them was animated, yet the editing of it was seamless. I'm, I'm just, I teared up because I felt like I was watching every possibility of cinema presented to me all at once. All my life, I've wanted to see a movie that is so bonkers, balls to the wall insane with its style, with its comedy, with its action, with its characters, with its visuals, everything. And I'll tell you what I said to Glory. She actually watched that with me. When we came out of the cinema, I said, that movie deserves every Oscar nomination, but it's not going to get any of them. I am so happy that I was wrong about that. This movie just kept going in the box office for months and months. It's A24's biggest movie of all time now. And this movie, where characters are threatened by an evil soul-sucking everything bagel, is now being considered a serious best picture contender. How is a movie that features a kung fu battle between two people with trophies stuck up their butts also being considered for all these award categories, almost every single one of the award categories. I personally think it should get best hair and makeup, best costume, best editing, best original screenplay, that Daniel should get best director, and all of our four main actors, by the way, should be up for acting nominations, Kei Hee Kwan, Stephanie Hsu, Jamie Lee Curtis, and especially Michelle Yeoh, and I realize that's the third person I've said now that deserves the Oscar for best female performance, but what can I say? It's a stacked category this year. Look, I, I'll just say, if the Oscars go for Tar or Fablemans this year or something else, that's fine. They have great options in those movies. But if Everything Everywhere All at Once was to win Best Picture, that to me is revolutionary. I know that a lot of people don't care about the Oscars, but to me, I work in the film industry. I'm not just a fan. That matters to me. That This movie full of googly eyes and, and a woman using a Pomeranian on a leash like, like nunchucks or whatever, I don't know what to call it, could win Best Picture. I've been gushing for a while. I probably forgot something. I just don't know where to start with this movie or where to end. I mean, Rakakuni... <laughs> I don't know. I feel like this movie was made for me. It is not only my favorite movie of the year, but this is one of my favorite movies of all time. Number one. There you go. Those are my top 10 movies of the year. I realized this was a pretty long video. Thanks so much if you watched it this far. That's amazing. Let me know in the comments. Are there any movies on this list that you don't like or that you think sound interesting now? Are there any movies that weren't on this list that you think I should have included? What's your top 10 list? Obviously, I love talking about this stuff. And if you're just discovering us and you like this video, hit the subscribe button and hit those notifications. I will talk a little bit more about movies in the future, whether it just be a community post or another video like this. We'll see. But me and Glory will be back together doing some cute relationship thing soon enough, I'm sure. Really appreciate y'all watching, and I'll see you on the next one.